Welcome to Hive Mind. This is Edge with my co-host, the speaker. How's it going, speaker? What's happening? Oh, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. So today, we're thinking about talking about Nexium, a, a case that date, dates back a few years or several years, but you know, really came to the forefront a couple of years ago. And people may be wondering, you know, why are we talking about this now? Well, you know, there's a lot of aspects of it that are still current. Claire Bronfman, the sentencing for her should be happening at the end of this month. Uh, Keith Ranieri's sentencing should be by the end of October. And so that's still relevant. And then, of course, the people that they're connected to are still out there. You know, we're talking about comp compromised politicians, uh, Hollywood elites, um, the same sort of thing with Epstein. We're talking about also child trafficking networks uh, being broken down that could have been uh, connected to Nexium. So there's a, still a lot of relevance to this topic, don't you think? Yeah, I think I think Nexium was one of those pills that you have to put on the spectrum. Like I think a lot of normal people really started to wake up a little bit more when this Nexium uh, uh, case kind of came to the forefront. Pe people were like, "Wait a second, actually, maybe there is sex cults in Hollywood." I definitely think it was. Uh, an early red pill for a lot of people uh, because you started to see connections to Hollywood then, especially with the Alison Mack connection. And this, this was, this was a cult, no doubt about it, that this was a cult. So let, let's go, let, let's start off and go back into a little bit about Keith Rainier. Now he was born in August 26, 1960. And if you watched our podcast uh, on the dark triad, we're going to try to figure out where he fits in, in into that because in in his childhood, his mother was an alcoholic, but that didn't really, there didn't seem to be a lot of abuse there. And like we discussed uh, on the last podcast is it doesn't really need to be abuse. Sometimes it can be overly praised. And Rainier's father actually came out and said, when he was younger, he told Keith that um, what, what we did is we told Keith about how gifted and how intelligent he was. And he said it was almost like a switch went off in this kid's brain. And suddenly overnight, he turned into like this Jesus Christ sort of a figure. He believed he was superior and better than anybody else. And he sort of became a deity in his own mind. So it, it seemed like over praise of him kind of led to this and I I think he fits on a sociopath uh, scale. What do you think, Edge? Oh, definitely. I I saw some some red flags as far as him being very narcissistic, um, either narcissist or psychopathic or sociopathic, but some somewhere on that spectrum for sure. Uh, he does definitely consider himself to be uh, one of the smartest men alive, and that was actually one of the selling points of Nexium and their executive success programs, and that's questionable. We can talk about that a little bit, about his IQ test, his take-home IQ test. But was um, he, he was in the Guinness Book of World Records. Right? Yes, so he took a, a take-home IQ test that there's no time limit on. It's all on the honor system. So, you know, anyone who takes these like, this particular IQ test, they take it home. They're not monitored as far as, take, you know, getting answers from anybody. I'm definitely um, skeptical as far as, you know, how he uh, took this test. But in his mind, he's this super genius. But to me, he just seems like a total scam artist and uh, a manipulator. And the way that I've heard his victims describe him, it was just total narcissistic behavior where he would, you know, find victims, use them, exploit them to the most that he could, and then move on to the next ones. He was, he was highly manipulative from a young age. I mean, there was this account 
uh, from a girl that he went in school with, and one of his classmates recalled the incident in which she unwittingly uh, shared compromising information about one of her sisters. Uh, who was about 10 years old at the time. Now, according to her recollection, Rania uh, had told her, and I quote, you know, it's like I have little bottles of poison I can hold over your head. I just don't think your parents or your sister would be very happy if I told them. And then she claims Rania would call her on and off and just say things like little bottles, little bottles. So it is it reinforces how manipulative he was at such a young age at coercing these women and trapping them because that's generally what it was. It was a trap. And his parents were called ever since he was younger. He used to have 13, 14 year old girls calling him all the time. Dozens of girls calling his house and he would keep, and they would overhear him keep telling them all the same things every single girl who would just repeat the same things. I love you. You're special. You're important. You're the only one in my life. And he, he was clearly lying because he was clearly saying it to all of them. Now, Rainier, uh reported that he read a book by Isaac Asimov uh, about mind control, which was themed the second foundation. And he actually credited that book as well as his inspiring work. For, uh, for Nixium. Now, uh, Rainier went to, uh, had a Waldorf education, so Steiner education. So if people don't know what a Steiner school is, a Steiner school kind of uh, focuses on more imagination and creativity as their, as their central focus, and they work on practical skills in a more holistic manner. Don't say anything bad with Steiner schools, but you can see from that where he kind of got that guru complex going on. He learned to manipulate and he learned to use these more holistic tactics uh, to work to his advantage. Yeah, and I, from what I understand, he also derived a lot of the concepts of Nexium from Scientology as well seems like such a sleazy, just scam artist, you know, from an outsider's perspective. But um, to these people that got close to him, he seemed like he had this sort of hypnotic effect on them, didn't he? Yeah, well, these these guru types generally do. So, like, it, it, and he didn't just kind of walk into Nexium. He worked at, like, he went through a few failures before he got there. So his first business venture was something called Consumer Byline. Now, this was a multi-level marketing program. And he kind of continued the, that trend going forward. But so this company would kind of uh, discount prices for groceries, dishwashers, uh, hotel stays, uh, pretty much stoking crowds of thousands of you know, pumped up profit-hungry people. And I quote from one of the person, people that was a distributor for him, a person called Robert Bremnier. Uh, he was like a mythical figure. A guy with a 240 IQ was coming into town. Now, Rainier says by the end of 1993 that he had sold over a billion dollars in goods and services, employed 80 people, and had a quarter of a million believers paying him about $19 a month to hawk his goods. Now, he claims he was worth about $50 million, yet he appeared to carry no money, uh, said Bremnia, adding that Rainier would sleep uh, all day, rolled out of his office around 10 p.m., and sometimes held meetings at like 1 a.m. Now, eventually, the bit that, that business got flagged, debt ballooned, customers complained, and I think regulators in about 20 states began to investigate him. And in 1993, the New York Attorney General uh, filed a civil lawsuit alleging uh, Kasuma's byline was a pyramid scheme, which it was. Now, without any wrongdoing, Rainier settled on a $40,000 payment, which he only paid $9,000 uh, because he said he couldn't pay the rest, although uh, he was pretty ample about his finances and living off his savings. And then there was one after that. That only lasted about a year. It was very short-lived. Uh, and it was a company called National Health Network. And it was the, the same thing. It was a multi-level marketing program. 
um, they sold vitamins, but didn't last long. And then it came to his third venture when he sort of kind of perfected this status, which is Nexium, which was started by Nancy Salzman, who was a psychiatric nurse at the time, and those two can collaborated together. Yeah, and they offered these seminars called executive success programs that were supposed to be like personal and professional improvement. And uh, so they'd offer these classes. People would pay thousands of dollars, you know, for these intensive programs. And some of them would go, you know, maybe five days and then or longer programs that would go for several years. He had developed this thing called rational inquiry. Uh, it was a technique that he used, and what it basically was is just expensive brainwashing. I mean, what they would do is they would they would learn about these people, uh, and exactly the way you explained that he would do as a child, where he would learn information about people, and then he would use it and exploit it and hold it over these people. Yeah, so rational inquiry, it, it's also used in Scientology. So what what it does, it's like a play, it, it's a polarity of questions and observations leading to, our, or this is how it's written, um, leading to answers and to greater awareness. But what this does is it puts the person there in a vulnerable position if you don't trust who's doing it to you. Do you know what I'm going to say right now? No. You're insecure about that. Yeah. Is that scary for you? No. Why not? Because I trust that what you're going to say is going to be good. And, be and in the end, you're going to be okay. I'll be fine, yeah. When we have insecurities, and this relates to vulnerability, uh -huh. where we think we may not be okay, then it becomes scary. See, it's not the insecurity that's the problem, it's the fear of the insecurity. So they'll ask you certain questions about your life. Um, to free you from whatever issues or things that are holding you down, you know, like, so what are you ashamed of, for example? And then they, you know, first they'll be hesitant, but they'll keep pushing, pushing the questions. And then they'll say, oh, I'm ashamed because I did something uh, that wasn't right with, uh, just as an example, with my sister's husband, let's just say. Right. Um, so now this cult and Rainier has this information on them. So now once they can gather enough of this information, they can use it against their victims. So it's extremely sinister. It's not painted that way, though. It's painted as a sort of uh, relief. You know, let go of these things that are burdening you, holding you down. Same thing happens in Scientology. They do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So the same thing that they do with the e-meter readings, that's what he would do with these sessions where they were exploring meaning. It was called exploration of meaning. And really it was just these one-on-one -on -one sessions where they would probe their members for information and dirt that could be used against them and, other, and others in order to control them. And that's not the only comparison to Scientology. I understand that, that Rainier, he was very much influenced by L. Ron Hubbard uh, and stole a lot of ideas and even wording for his classes. Uh, there was somebody who was a former member of Scientology for many years who later took classes at Nexium and noticed the comparisons and even the words as just total thievery and, and brought this up to them and, and the, the, you know, Salzman and, and others who were high up in, in Nexium were like, no, no, Keith Ranieri came up with these <laughs> concepts. And it's like, no, uh, he just totally ripped them off from Scientology. But, you know, even the, the term suppressives they would use in their, their teachings at Nexium, which is a, a term they use in Scientology, to kind of explain anyone who's a, a critic of the cult, anyone who is uh, bringing negativity in your life, those are the, the terms that they use as, you know, these people are suppressives, any basically, basically any outsider. And so, um, but he also 
thought that the, the model of Scientology was really well thought out as far as collecting money and information from their members, uh, also using intimidation tactics and going after their members and going after their critics. And they and Nexium really followed that model, didn't they? Yeah, well, he had recruits paying up to $7,500 for a 12-hour session. So it's not it, it like he wasn't just robbing them; he was robbing them and controlling them as well. And you, you see exactly the same thing with Scientology. Yeah, and L. Ron Hubbard uh, filed a lot of patents and copyrights of of terms and words and things. And and uh, Keith Rainier did the same thing with Nexium. In fact, he was. He was touted, you know, as this genius, and they used his his patents that he filed as sort of a validation of that. Like they would brag about it in their classes. Like, look at this super genius. He has, you know, 147 patents pending, but anybody can file patents. And most of them actually got rejected, but a lot of them, like his um, whole idea of rational inquiry he had filed a patent for, I think that was actually rejected. They felt like they had some sort of proprietary, you know, ownership of these ideas. So it was just a way of controlling and really kind of like scamming money out of people. Like if you would file a patent that was just general enough, you could, you could go after people for licensing. Mm. And like they, they would use certain techniques. So, um, collateralizing like small amounts of money um, that one might forfeit if they don't do certain things for the day. Um, they would hold that sort of stuff against them. And then once you get into the more sinister side of things, which is uh, the DOS section, uh, which was the secret society even under Nixium. So DNA, uh, DOS uh, stands for Dominus, Obsequirus, uh, Solarium, and that means the secret sisterhood. Now, that, I think, was Rainier's main plan, was to have this sex cult un un underneath this thing that which he could control, dominate, and I thought, I, I think money was secondary to his godlike fantasy of having that. But that is where the real sinister stuff really starts to happen. Yeah, it looks like this this form of mind control that they would use would um, it would reverse the the meaning of words. So women's empowerment really was women's enslavement, and so these women were thought were led to believe like this sisterhood, this secret society, this sisterhood of female sex slaves was basically, you know, some sort of way of empowering themselves when in actuality they were being just completely subjected to total humiliation and slavery, sex slaves. Yeah. So he, he convinced them that in order to free themselves, they would have to totally humiliate themselves first which makes no rational sense, but to them, it, it, it did. To free themselves from the burden, they had to be at the lowest place prior to getting to the higher place. This is the sort of things that these cult leaders do. Um, but like, so, and then once he kind of had them in that sort of a grip, I mean, you'd have to, you were required before you kind of got into this sisterhood to provide him with nude photos and what other, poten other potential damaging information about themselves as collateral. Right. Yeah, and that is kind of like Scientology as well when they would do the these sort of confessions. That's what it reminds me of. And also, you know, going back to the Scientology thing, um, you know, Scientology uses this model of, of targeting uh, influential people in Hollywood and gaining political influence. And, and you can see that Nexium did that as well. Obviously, you, you know, the, the, the face of Nexium, you see Alice and Mac, but they were targeting lots of people in influential circles to uh, kind of bolster their claims of success. And also, you know, they made these these high promises to people like they they could tell people, you know, that this is the way we're going to save the world. And these people actually thought that 
they thought that Nexium was a way to save the world. Well, it, yeah, they had that. They had a twelve-point mission statement, which is sort of like their twelve commandments. Uh, and one of them was, uh, "People control money, wealth, and resources of the world. It is essential for the survival of humankind for these things to be controlled by successful ethical people." I pledge to ethically control as much of the money, wealth, and resources of the world as possible within my success plan. I will always support the ethical control of these things. Such, such a, I mean, there's such a conflicting statement to control the world's resources and money ethically. <laughs> it's, it's, but like all, all, all these um, twelve commandments, they, they either filled with projection. Or they sound too good to be true, and that's kind of when you know you're kind of going into a cult here, right? Is when when they start selling you this utopian bullshit, right? Which, which things that are just never going to make it happen, or they, it it's just it's full utopian crap. And if you read some of these, at like any rational person would read this and just go, "This is ludicrous!" Like these are actual mission mission statements. You gotta be kidding me, right? Yeah, and it makes an outsider looking in just wonder how did these people get sucked into this? But the the more you look into it, you see that they were really using forms of mind control. And as you had mentioned, Rainier uh, based a lot of their teachings off of mind control techniques. And I see that there actually are several of them from hypnosis to that rational inquiry, mind control, even trauma-based mind control and blackmail. One of the methods that they used was the fright experiment. Now, there's, there's, there's a huge lawsuit going on about this at the moment. I think it was over 80 people have started to sue over this because this was done... Uh, without really their knowledge, they kind of strapped them to a chair, put electrodes in their brain, and they thought they were just, you know, going to play a video of, of something generally wholesome, but instead they were shown graphic videos of uh, beheadings, murder. Uh, it, it was pretty, pretty, pretty graphic, some of the stuff they watched. And instead of letting them, you know, go and stuff, they would just monitor them while they were sitting there just watching this terror-induced uh, content. Yeah, I've heard it described as like clockwork orange, where these these women who had uh, volunteered for this fright study uh, didn't realize actually what they were getting into. And uh, yeah, they were like forced to watch like gang rape and dismemberment and just really gruesome evil stuff to the point where they were like crying and screaming and throwing up or dry heaving. Um, so just really, really unethical stuff conducted by supposed doctors. And, um, you know, this is the kind of, of uh, treatment that they would get. And this was all based on, you know, what, what Rainier had, had filed a patent for on this was on um, how to rehabilitate Luciferians. That's what this study was really all, all about, was rehabilitating Luciferians, which is bizarre to me. And it kind of goes deeper into the, you know, the spiritual side of, of all of this. Um, but, you know, and we know that with Satanism and SRA and all of that, they do also use trauma-based mind control to uh, watch and witness really, really horrific things in a sort of, in, in the sort of the same way. They also used what looked like hypnosis. And we were watching a video where um, Rainier was talking with, with Alison Mack. And you were like, God, this looks so weird. It looks like she's under some sort of hypnosis or something. Hmm. But I actually think that they were using hypnosis uh, techniques. And I think that uh, Salzman was actually trained in neuro-linguistic neuro programming techniques, which is really just, they were using a form of hypnosis to convince people, uh, you know, that they can create their own reality. They can be whoever they want to be. There's no such thing as a victim. And this is just setting them up um, to be victims. If there is no such thing as a, as a victim, once you're a victim, you don't even realize that you're a victim. Exactly. 
Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But then, you know, they're taught that they're not victims. Yes. You, you, you will never, you can never be in the position if you're a victim. You're just not that way. So when they are becoming victims and when they are getting abused, the, their mind is, is splintered. Because they've been reinforced and taught so much that, you know, I'm not a victim in my life. What is happening right now is not me being a victim. Yeah, exactly. It looked like this rational inquiry is really just, you know, it was a form of brainwashing, washing, but it was also like redefining words. So your perception of thing was totally reversed. So, you know, bad is good, sad is happy, pain is pleasure, uh, enslavement is empowerment. And so they had this total reversal of reality and it was very just completely manipul manipulative to the point where these people were hypnotized, brainwashed, and total slaves. See, there's, and, and like I said, there's a lot of these, these places out there and you've got to really be careful about these self-improvement uh, sort of, or you can call them communities. Uh, look, there's some good ones out there, I'm sure. I mean, I've seen some ones that seem pretty much on the level. But these are the sort of places where these people, these cult-like people, kind of wiggle their way into because they attract the vulnerable. They attract the people that are looking for something more. They attract the people that have already either been abused in their lives or they're down or people that are just looking for a new way or they've given up on life. They, they would need a new direction. And then you find this person that, you know, you've been told he's so intelligent. You've been told all these things about him, how successful he is. Uh, you know, he's, he's met with the Dalai Lama. He has the Hollywood, you know, he has Hollywood stars under his wing, pushing this company, making it bigger than life than it is. And that's where they kind of hooked you. You know, there's, there's plenty of people that left Nexium uh, when it started to get it to a point where they were like, okay, wait a second. This is actually a cult and I don't want anything to do with it. But for everyone that leaves, there's another one stays. Yeah. And I think that a lot of these people that have left have been f uh, fearful uh, for their lives, fearful for their finances and their families, because because they collect collateral on these people, because they make them sign non-disclosure agreements and so forth, that once you leave, it's kind of like Scientology, where you're completely ostracized, you're afraid to speak out because of the consequences, because they really do aggressively go after these people who are critical of the of the cult. Oh, yeah. You can't speak bad about the cult. And uh, blackmail was another form of mind control. They had the collateral over all of their their members using nude photos or written confessions of things. Um, but then also, you know, going after people who were just critical uh, of the cult. And, you know, I want to talk about the uh, the blackmail and the extortion side of things because, you know, this is where we get into similarities uh, with, say, for example, Epstein and that sex trafficking uh, group that, and, and it seems to, to have some similarities there because they were targeting high profile individuals and they were collecting blackmail material on them. Also, you know, with the Bront Bronfman sisters, their dad, Edgar, had a lot of connections. And we know they were hacking Edgar Bronfman's email and computers. And they were actually targeting, you know, uh, bank accounts and phone records of other high-profile people like politicians, uh, officials, judges, anyone who was critical of them or that they needed to, to compromise, basically. Yeah, so there's a lot of famous people that, you know, kind of came in in the early stages. Now, with Brofman, before he died, he said it was a cult. He came out and said it was a cult early. He did. He is actually one of the first because, you know, his daughters joined it. I think that Edgar took some Nexium, Nexium classes and then later his daughters joined and they became completely just engulfed in it and that's when he came out there was a an article put out where they had interviewed edgar and he said it was a cult 
And it was shortly thereafter that uh, the, the daughters hacked him and um, were basically monitoring all of his email correspondences, which he had correspondence with, you know, Hillary Clinton and many others. You know, Edgar Bronfen's connected to the, uh, the mega group. Uh, the, the, the Bronfman's are connected to the Rothschilds. Uh, they're connected to the Clintons. Um, so Edgar Bronfman had a ton of connections, and I can only imagine the kind of information that they were obtaining from those emails that they were monitoring of Edgar Bronfman. There's other politicians as well that got named, like uh, Chuck Schumer, Elliot, Elliot Spitzer, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand. Kirsten Gillibrand, her father worked or did some kind of contractual work for Nexium, and then her stepmother uh, joined Nexium. It seems like Kirsten Gillibrand is is in kind of deep with them, although she's not spoken out about her connections to them. There's probably a lot of um, politicians, and we see that. And you have to wonder, you know, how many of them are compromised. And you know, Nexium is really one of the one of the dominoes in that series and you just have to wonder you know how many more dominoes are going to fall that we haven't even seen fall yet um there's a lot of mexico connections that we need to talk about um the two former presidents vicente fox and carlos salinas are connected to nexium through their kids that are um part of it the bronfmans may have even been uh opening up shell corporations that they may have been laundering money coming up from Mexico. We know that kids were coming up from Mexico, you know, because Vicente Fox and um, Carlos Salinas uh, have connections and have been accused of, of having dealings with the cartels, you know? So there may have been a lot of, of money that they were laundering uh, for the cartels and that may be connected to drugs or child trafficking, human trafficking. Well, yeah, we we already have the human trafficking side of things already. I mean, he he, he was already trafficking uh, these women to hire members of Nixium. Mm -hmm. As it was, he was just trading them around already. Then we also have, just like with Epstein, we have this whole Clinton connection. I mean, uh, the Salzmans were members of the board uh, on the Clinton Global Initiative, you know, and Epstein... Uh, claims to have started the Clinton Global Initiative, which may have also been just another money laundering scheme. And that's what that looks like as well. So, so it all kind of connects. But yeah, we do need to talk more about the trafficking, the human trafficking, the child trafficking. You know, according to Frank Parlato, who's really broken a lot of the the story on Nexium, he was a former publicist for Nexium, and then he's been really a whistleblower ever since. Um, but according to him, they routinely trafficked young girls up from Mexico and turned them into sex slaves. And, uh, you know, many of these young girls were raped by Keith Rainier. But one in particular, uh, this key witness was at Rainier's trial. She was uh, routinely raped by Rainier and she, when she was a young teen. And she fell in love with this, you know, other young boy and as punishment for doing so, she was actually imprisoned for two years inside her own home. I think her parents were even part of Nexium, So, like, they were brainwashed into this cult as well. And I think that that's kind of a trend is that you see, like, a generational sort of uh, brainwashing. With her near's past as well, I mean, this way you've got to kind of look into these people when you join groups or communities and stuff like that. And that's why these, these these people need to go to jail because when he was 24, he was having sexual relationships with 15-year-olds. He actually married one when he got um, older and she actually killed herself by suicide later uh, in life. But they got together when she was 15 and, she, and he had multiple relationships with young girls. Hmm. And, you know, no, nothing was done about that and you see where it goes to I, this this connection with the child trafficking it goes really deep nexium was connected to rainbow cultural gardens which is actually a preschool and so you know their members would um put their children 
in these schools, this preschool Rainbow Cultural Gardens, and it was all over the U.S. and Mexico. I think they had some in Florida, New York, California, Spain, Guatemala, Mexico. Uh, I think a lot of them have been closed down since all of this broke, but you know, they were raising, you know, babies, toddlers, preschool, preschoolers, and th- with this promise that they were going to be teaching these children to be these geniuses that could speak multiple languages, and ha- but really, it was raising sociopaths. I mean, what they were doing was they were, um, these, these children would have a different teacher or nanny every day, and they would speak a different language every day. And so these children were never developing any sort of real meaningful relationships um, with humans. And they weren't even really able to speak fully one language. Uh, It was just babbling uh, in various different hodgepodge of languages. And so, um, you know, really just raising the next group of mind controlled slaves is what they were doing through these these uh, preschools, which is really sad. But you have to wonder how much of these children were trafficked. And uh, a lot of these schools were in South America, Mexico. Uh, and that leads us to this town in Mexico, Chihuahua, Mexico, that NixVM is, is connected to, uh, where they were actually trafficking a lot of young girls up from uh, to become their sex slaves. And um, there's this community there, this community of excommunicated fundamentalist Mormons, okay, that's been there since 1900, living in this town in Mexico. And last year, that became huge news because nine women and children were murdered from that town. And supposedly that took place um, as part of some war between the cartels. But I suspect, and I've always suspected, that it was a hit related to this, these Nexium connections, which are coming to light. I've always been curious about that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I remember when that was news. So I definitely think he was either bringing them into the States, using them, just using that town as sort of just a transport point. Yeah, I mean, you have to wonder. So, well, but we do have some good news, though, and that is that, you know, this cult has been kind of stopped in its tracks. There's obviously a lot more uh, information that they're garnering from it. But on, on June 19, 2019, uh, the jury found Renier guilty on all charges. After five hours of deliberation, uh, he was found guilty of sexual exploitation of, of a child, possession of child pornography. Uh, sex trafficking, attempted sex trafficking, identity theft, uh, trafficking for labor and services, conspiracy to alter records, uh, sex trafficking conspiracy, forced labor conspiracy, racketeering, and wire fraud conspiracies. But uh, like Ed said at the start, uh, the sentencing, he he still maintained his innocence because, of course, they do. They never break these um, psychopaths. But um, so the sentencing on that is the 27th of October. Mm-hmm. And I think the prosecutors are seeking a life sentence for that. So yes. oh, they should. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Claire Bronfman, her sentencing is scheduled for September 30th. And they're looking at five years for her. And a $500,000 fine, which to me seems just too low. That's but I think... Cheaper. I know. I think they're actually exceeding the max um, on this. Prosecutors are seeking, you know, the max. So, and uh, with, as far as Allison Mack goes, no sentencing yet for her is scheduled. And uh, she's not even currently incarcerated as far as I understand. Um, I think she's under house arrest. Well, I'm wondering um, if there was some sort of deal struck because I know that she did um, probably give up a lot of information on some key people that they are looking at going after, don't you think? Mm. Uh, well, Nixium still hasn't completely disappeared. I mean, there's still some members of it trying to keep it alive. I mean, if you, if you their new website now is a website called uh, WeAreTheForgottenOnes.org. Yeah, so they're still trying to... Um, 
there's still a small group of people trying to keep this movement alive, but I don't think it's many. Uh, hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more come to light, especially, you know, with, uh, with Ghislaine Maxwell and all of the, the Epstein saga coming to light too. So lots more coming down the pipe, I hope, um, as far as breaking up these cults and child sex trafficking rings. What do you think? Yep. Good. Get them all done. <laughs> Do them all. Yeah, yeah. We got to clean all this stuff up. You, and it's all connected to these compromised politicians. And, and there's no way we can drain the swamp and clean up all the compromised politicians until we really clean up these these sex rings that have been used to um, to entrap these these compromised politicians. It's all connected. Uh, and- and there's 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 more. Mm-hmm. No, it's just a matter of just bringing them to light and you know, just making making them public. But you know, like like Nixium, that we'll slowly start getting information on them too, and we can we can start uncovering them as well. Yep, like a dominoes, one after the next. So. Stay mm-hmm. tuned, stay tuned. And uh, thanks for joining us here today on Hive Mind with Speaker and Edge. Please be sure to share the podcast. Um, and we'll see you back next time right here on Hive Mind. <laughs>